this point of the service, we promised a professional ball handler. <laughs> Seeing as I'm the only one in the room getting paid at this very moment, that makes me a professional, and this is about as good as I can do, right here. Friday evening, we got the call that Dan Wetzel, his wife gave birth to a baby. After nine years of trying, the great event finally happened. He was not going to be able to come. The baby was born over a month premature and some complications. But he still said, if you need me, I'll be there. Well, what kind of a jerk makes their employees come to work even in the best of circumstances at the birth of a new child. And so we said, you know, no, it's not uh, essential. We, we will do something. And, and yesterday, it worked. It flowed. It was perfect. If we'd planned it that way, it wouldn't have worked. But that's the way it happened. And, and things went great. And, and I'll be honest, uh, our upward season with a few hiccups has been excellent and we had 284 kids involved I mean come on that's pretty amazing and and I doubt seriously and I made the case yesterday that that any one of those kids will ever make it to the NBA I'm thinking maybe division one maybe but nothing beyond that. It's not about basketball. And I can't keep saying that enough. We, uh, we had so many people who gave so much. And, and we, we take a minute and we praise God, but, but I, I want to declare that I am thankful for the church that supports it. Some people gave 10 hours a week. Some people gave 30 hours a week. Some people gave $60 to pay for a kid. Some people prayed. Some people showed up. Some people coached. Some people wore the coach's shirt and pretended to coach. <laughs> some, some people popped popcorn. Some people put salt on a moist pretzel. Yeah. And they were good. Don't, don't get me wrong. Some people came and cleaned toilets. Some people came and cleaned puke off the floor. Some people carried out trash. Some people ran the vacuum. Some people tried to steal the new vacuum because they thought it was awesome. <laughs> some people, some people sat in the bleachers and yelled for a bunch of kids they never knew. Some people kept score. Some people pointed out mistakes. Those were referees, by the way. Some, some, people, some people prayed, faithfully prayed. And at the end of the season, we can step back and say, what a cool thing God did when He took a bunch of people and use their good and best efforts for Him. That's the story of church. Plain and simple. That's the purpose of church. To do your best at whatever it is you do for the glory of God that He might be exalted in your community. That's the point of church. Well, Dan Wetzel didn't just let the kids down with the Upwards banquet that we were going to have today. Dan Wetzel was scheduled to be standing right here at this very moment. And when Dan Wetzel schedules himself to be right here at this very moment, this guy says, cool, I'm going to read a book this week. I'm not going to work on a sermon because we got another guy coming to do the sermon and I think it's hilarious. Okay, not really. But, but I said, you know, today we got a pretty full house. On the one day that our main guy skips town and is not here. 
And I just knew last night we got home from upwards and I'd say, you know, I'm going to work on this sermon. And I was on the couch a grand total of about 32 minutes and I was done. And I woke up at 7 and then I woke up at 8 and then I went to finally got up again at 9.30 and went to bed. And I just knew that God would take care of it all. God knew what he wanted shared. And apparently a lot of us need to hear it because the place is full this morning. There's an interesting story, and I was sharing it yesterday in our devotion, where Jesus and the disciples are sitting around, and, and the disciples, I don't know what their problem was. You'd think after a few minutes with Jesus that, that they, would be, they would be convinced not to be so dumb. But that's not the case. In Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, at the time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What a stupid question to ask the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, for starters. And Jesus called to him a little child, and he put that child in the midst of them. What I really think it happened is that Jesus took the little kid and he set him up on his lap. You want to talk about the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Let's talk about this little guy right here. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Finally, Jesus says something that is cool. Play this out. Play that out. I mean, the, the millstone thing... At the time of Jesus making this instruction, there are two basic kinds of millstones. There's the kind of millstone that you keep at home. The, the home version that, that a person just operates by, by grinding the stone. Four or five pounder, no big deal. And then there's this great millstone that, that requires a team of oxen to work it. It weighs thousands of pounds. And, and Jesus says... If you mess with a little kid, it would be better to have one of these big millstones tied around your neck. Not the little five pounder, the big one. And that you be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's cool sounding, isn't it? I mean, talk about an express train to the bottom. And you can fight against it all you want. But there ain't nothing you can do. When the millstone is around your neck and you're in the water, you're not swimming out of that one. And you can't even pick it up and carry it out at that weight. Whoever causes one of these children of mine to sin, it would be better that they just bite the dust. Think about that. See, I think there are two ways that we cause children to sin. Sins of commission, the things we do, and sins of omission, the things we fail to do that cause our children to enter into sin. The things we do, some of our habits, some of our behaviors, some of the things we scream when we're, we're watching the ball game on TV. The things we do to discourage godly living in the life of a kid. Oh, it doesn't matter. You don't need to do that. That's just for the fanatics. I talked to a guy yesterday and he was bragging. A Christian man bragging that from this weekend through the end of summer, his family wouldn't be at church anymore. Bragging. A Christian bragging because their kid played baseball on some special team. And they traveled all over this planet during the summer. 
for a middle school baseball player. I said, man, brother, I'll pray for you all because you're missing the point. What are you teaching your kid? That God's cool until baseball season and then He requires nothing of you? That God's cool until band season and then God requires nothing from you? And he bragged and he walked away. Whoever causes one of these little ones of mine to sin by doing things that discourage godly living. Our kids need every chance we can give them. Our world, it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse with every passing day. And we can't afford as adults to sit back and do little or nothing with our children because our opposition will do whatever it takes to get the lives of our kids. Plain and simple. Why does MTV have such a huge, huge success rate? Because they're willing to spend whatever it takes to reach a kid. What about us? How far are we willing to go to keep a kid? To save a kid? To rescue a kid? And then there's the, the sins of omission, the things we fail to do to equip our kids for godly living. I'll be honest. Dang it, they're in here. When, when we were in Paducah, we sent Hunter to a Christian school. And man, that kid, he learned Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse, and I'd put him up against almost anybody in this room right now. But it's not because we taught him. It's because we paid someone else to teach him. It is our jobs as parents to train our children in godly living, to equip our children for godly living, to plug our children into godly lifestyles, to have them in church, to have them in Sunday school, to have them in youth events, to have them serve beside us as we get off the couch and go do something in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe not. It's not that big of a deal. They'll get it when they're older. We don't want to force them to, 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 to choose now. We need them to allow them to experience everything so they can formulate their own opinions. Yeah. That's sweet, but it doesn't work. We train our children when they're little. Don't stick your finger in the light socket because it makes your hair curly. We don't let them experience that. If we see them getting ready to stick their finger in the light socket, we take the basketball and we throw it at them. Because a basketball in the head is better than electrocution, right? We've got to train our kids. We've got to train our kids. We can't sit back and hope somebody else does it. They're not going to get it at school. They're not going to get it in Cub Scouts or Girl Scouts or any of that. If our kids are going to grow up to be godly followers of Jesus Christ, it starts with us in this room doing it for our kids. End of story. Jesus says, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Hey, news flash. Some of us need to ungrow up a little bit. I'll just be honest, we're too serious. We take stuff way too serious. Jesus says, unless you become like a child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. What is it about kids that Jesus likes so much? When the rest of us are trying to be all proper, the kids are still praising the Lord. Shh. Quit. Oh man, don't ever do that. Well, let me rephrase that. <laughs> but little kids are so honest with their praise. They're so honest with their faith. They're, they're so trustworthy. 
and so trusting. They're so filled with faith. They're hopeful. I, I, mean, I think about the kids in your life on Christmas Eve. That they're going to wake up tomorrow and there's going to be a pony in the kitchen. And they go to bed and they believe that with everything that's in them. Year after year after year. There's never going to be a pony in the kitchen. <laughs> but keep believing it all you want. See, what I'm starting to think is, is somehow we've turned things upside down. And the things that don't really matter, those are the things we get all torn up about. And the things that do matter, those are the things that we neglect the most. And I'm reading this passage of Jesus, and, and Jesus is saying, guys, here's what matters the most. That you treat children the way I expect you to. And not only treat children that way, but that you become like those very children yourself. Yesterday, I'm not... I'll admit it, I hate basketball. March monotony kills me. But it's a tool. It's a great tool. My team, okay, maybe because I don't like basketball, keep that here. But since I'm in it, I'm in it to win it. 248 to 91, 92. That's how my team outscored their opponents this season. <laughs> now that I'm keeping up with that, okay, I don't know the foggiest thing about basketball. I never played basketball. Never liked it. Still don't. I cheer for whoever's playing Kentucky. <laughs> That's it. But my little team, we got done with our game yesterday and, and we lost by four points. First loss all season. And we went back to our little locker room and, and, and we're sitting there on those little bitty stools. And I said, guys, I want you to know how proud I am of you. We've had the most fun this year. I said, I, we didn't win every game. We lost one today, but we played really good. And I'm still proud of you. And this little boy, <laughs> he said, coach, like you're, I'm a real coach. <laughs> coach, I just want you to know you're the best basketball coach in the whole world. And I'll be honest, I mean, you know, we've talked about Little House on the Prairie enough that I'm the first guy to start leaking when stuff like that happens. And I looked, at it, and of course, my first thought was, man, you are one pitiful kid. <laughs> but what I discovered in the moment, what I, I found out from the rest of these guys is that I was the greatest coach in the world, not because of my basketball abilities, not because I was Bobby Knight Jr. out on the court. I was coach of the decade because I welcomed little kids into my life and I made them feel like they were there on purpose. Hey. Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. You see how this works? Man, there's a lot of stuff in life that doesn't matter. But we only have one opportunity to get it right with our kids. And so I ask you today, how you doing as you relate to the young people in your life? Are you dropping the ball? 
Are you getting it right? Are you doing your best? Are you giving it your best? Are you giving it your all to reach the kids that God has put in your presence? My favorite poem, and I share it all the time. I think it applies to most of life, but specifically I've been applying it this week to basketball and to little kids and to their crabby parents. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you'll win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. But do good anyway. Give the world your best, the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the end, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. I'm thankful for our Upwards program, and I'm thankful for everybody who sweats for it and gives for it and sacrifices for it. It's part of the bigger picture of raising young people to honor and glorify God as they grow into adulthood. I can stick my head out the front door for about five minutes and can see where society isn't doing so much with our kids. The proof of that is everywhere. If God's people don't do something, who will? Who will? Let's pray. God, this morning, I'm glad you're not like us. God, this morning, I'm glad that your priorities aren't the same as ours. You're not thinking about the bottom line and you're not thinking about expense and, and all of that. God, God, you just think about the value of a kid. And you say that you place your utmost value on just one child. God, may we, may we grasp that part of You and embrace it and, and make it part of ourselves and part of the life of our church that we, every one of us, would be willing to do whatever it takes to see that our kids grow up honoring You. Now, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's demanding. Sometimes it makes us look like we're not so nice, but... But, but God, we're in it the long haul to raise up godly young men and godly young women. Give us the courage to do what's hard. Give us the strength to do that which is difficult. Give us the willingness to make the sacrifices that are required. Thank you for our children. Not only are they our church tomorrow, they're our church today. They keep us grounded. They keep us mindful of what it is you value in a follower. God, thank you for our kids. Bless them. Give us the wisdom that it takes to train them and raise them. Give us the desire to make them our top priority and to prioritize their lives so that you are reflected at the top of that list in their lives. God, help us honor you with all the little lives that you put around us. This is our prayer in Christ's name.